my voice on recording. Okay, a few things. Welcome, thank you for coming. We appreciate that you guys are willing to come and get the extra training. Um, here's the housekeeping stuff. Um, is your availability changing? Yours is. <laughs> you're leaving us, but you know, like if you have kids and they're gonna be home for the summer, uh, what's your availability gonna be? Is it gonna be different if you're in school? Are you going home for the summer? We need to know these things so that we can get shifts covered if you want more hours and we know that and we have people leaving, then we can say, hey, here, these are, this is what's open, you know? Um, so let us know, you can text it in. Well, we have a link that we can send out about availability changes. I think it went out already once, no? Yeah, it went out once. Once, yeah. Um, let's see, what else? Uh, so if you've been with us a while, it used to be where you would call into the office and then you would text the after hours phone. Well, we don't really have the after hours phone. With the office, you can call or text the 224-5910. Um, and then, uh, so you can get call or text through that number um, and we'll reply. Um, so if you need to um, let us know something and it's maybe after hours or whatever, um, you can just text. But someone does have a device that gets those texts, so if it's not an emergency, don't text after hours because it goes off and then they look at it and, I mean, that's what they're there for, but... Um, Right, so, but if you're texting, text the 224-5910 number, not the old after hours number anymore. So, and was there something else I was supposed to say about that? You can call that other 224 number after because it is transferred to another call. Yes. Another phone. Yeah, so if it's an emergency and you've had like a client fall or you can't make it to your shift, and it is not in the office hours time, you can still call that number and it will be transferred. But that's like emergency. And if you can't clock in at nine, your shift's at you know, 10 at night, you can just text in the morning after eight o'clock and just say, hey, I couldn't clock in or I couldn't clock out. That way someone's not being woken up or Jamie appreciates that. We open that at 9 now, actually. Oh, yes. We open at 9. So those are office hours. 9 to 5, Monday through Thursday, and 9 to 4 on Fridays. So any other thing you want said about the after hours? You said it perfectly. Okay. <laughs> Great. Um, so before, Amber was kind of in scheduling. I am not so much. So if you're talking or texting with the office, that's the scheduling team. If I happen to text you, a lot of times I do it on my own phone number, but I always try and sign my name if it's coming from the office number. So that way you know it's me. Um, I know scheduling tries to do their best to say their name afterwards too. Um, so I just want to make sure you guys knew when you're texting in and asking questions or maybe picking up shifts or whatever. It's usually scheduling. Um, so, but I'm always available as well. So, um, okay. so today, um, we really wanted to have John come in. He has done an in-service for us before, but trying to really take care of our clients 100% on all the needs that they have. And John works for Active Home Health and Hospice. And so he would like to just have a discussion with you guys today. Um, you know, maybe we have a client that can be getting more help through home health, or maybe they're declining and it's time for hospice. So when we know things to be looking out for, and we can notice those, and you guys are so good about texting and changes and things like that with your clients. 
Um, but he's here to give us some information to help us get our clients the best care possible. You guys do amazing when you guys are in there, but maybe they can get a little bit more help through home health or hospice. And so he's here. He's I really like him. <laughs> he comes in, he visits us um, in the office, and he always brings education. And so I love it. I've learned a ton from him, and he's patient, and I think you guys are going to really enjoy it today. And how could you not love Plinko and prizes? <laughs> um, so, as I said, his name is John Meekham, and he's with Active Home Health and Hospice. Um, and he'll be talking to us kind of about the difference between home health and, and hospice and what some of the things are like qualifiers so that our clients can maybe get more help if needed. Um, great educator, extremely knowledgeable, and we are just really excited to have him today. Oh, and if anybody feels like putting a magnet on their car, but just as a need a trusted caregiver, ask him to send you there. I know you do. Yours is faded. No, I've only had one. <laughs> so we'll have John come up, but afterwards, there are homemade rolls and homemade freezer jam and butter and honey for you guys to have Yum. when you're done in the lab. Chewing, then maybe the questions wouldn't come. So he's a wealth of knowledge. So come on up and ask questions, guys. He's amazing. That's, that's a lot of pressure. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you for allowing me to come and talk with you. I am not one to do a lecture. That's boring. I don't want to sit up here and talk at you. I want to talk with you. I want to learn what you guys know your experiences and what's important and valuable and, and you hear stuff from you so I can learn too. So I'm going to ask a few questions to start. Uh, when did we do home health? And by we, that means in general. And when does home health happen? And there's no right or wrong answers here. <laughs> I'm just gathering opinion or what you guys think always from a young age. We you, do home you're health. giving home health to little babies. Okay. <laughs> uh, well, that's true. You're, do, you're doing health care from the very beginning. Okay. That's the thing. When you come home from a hospital, from a fall, from illness, okay. just needing some extra help to get stronger. Okay. I have a lot of good answers there. I was thinking all the time, you eat to get healthy. <laughs> <laughs> and that is true. So, what I'm looking for or wondering about is when there's an order from a doctor for home health. So keep that in mind. When can you do an order or when does an order come or what is happening when an order comes like this person needs home health? And when do we do hospice? Have a when, an idea of when we do hospice? When the person asks for it. Okay. I see some, some, some pondering in your head. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe some other thoughts that aren't coming out verbally, and that's okay. Okay, so I'm going to go back and say, why do we do home health? Again, no right or wrong answer. Just I'm they listening. cannot do it for themselves. Okay. They need assistance. And but I've seen cases that they get better and they, <laughs> they, they don't need any more. Yes. They don't have to be dying to have that. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think 
if the patient wants to receive care at home, maybe they don't want to be in a facility and they have the option to stay at home. Right. Sounds good. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else? Why we do home health? Because we can. Because we can. Because <laughs> the doctor said so, so that's why. Um, why do we do hospice? Comfort. Because we need it. Because we need it. All right. <coughs> All right. Good answers. All good answers. Because it helps me understand what you guys are thinking. So, all right. Are all of you caregivers in here? Every one of you have, is, is currently or has taken care of someone. All right. I want all of you to raise your hand. Like this. This is how you do it. <laughs> if you can, and, and keep it up. If you can answer yes to one of these situations, you can put your hand down. Okay? So keep it up until you can think in your mind say yes to that. Okay. The person I take care of, or a person that I take care of, has recently had a medication change or a medication adjustment or a new medication. Does it, does it apply to past experiences? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. The person that I take care of, I've noticed, I've noticed, it's a noticeable weight change. They've either gained weight or lost weight. Okay. The person that I take care of has had a fall recently. Okay. So raise your hands high if you still have them up. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. How many people are here? Supposedly not me. <laughs> okay, so in three questions, more than half of your clients qualify for home health. And that was just three questions. Three scenarios. So we're going to learn more scenarios that qualify someone. Okay? So think of the question on when and why for home health and what you guys talked about. And listen to this. This is, this is from pretty much Medicare. I'm reading the Medicare information on why someone would qualify. The goals of home health care services are to help individuals monitor and treat an illness or injury or unstable health status, this is the key, before it leads to a, a serious illness. So over here, we heard after they go to the hospital, they get an order mm -hmm. for home health. According to this, what's the goal of home health? Before. Before. So we're doing, we've been doing home health wrong for a long time. For example, it's preventative. Something happens and we throw physical therapy at it. Because, oh, they had a fall. Well, let's get physical therapy in there to make them stronger so they don't fall. Well, why did they fall? Because they didn't have the strong motor of underneath. That could be a reason. They didn't have the equipment they need to keep them balanced. They didn't have the right equipment. They didn't have the therapy to learn how to control. Right. They haven't, had, they haven't had training on their how to be safe. The families have no training on when to do anything. <laughs> families have no training. Okay, we're getting we're good, good answers here. Uh, what if their medications are off and, and they're causing dizziness and and confusion. And that's the reason for the fall. Is physical therapy going to fix that? No. What if there's an infection that's causing confusion and weakness? Is Did physical therapy going to fix that? No. So home health is supposed to be, according to Medicare, nursing-based. You want the nurse to come in there and find out the reasons of, well, why are they falling? What's their blood pressure? What's, is there an infection? Is there a medication problem? Is there, what are all these things that could be contributing to the fall? So 
Again, it's before. And it's, and this is, this is important to you guys. We focus on assisting the patient to remain at home, avoiding hospitalizations or admissions to long-term term care facilities. So guess what? You guys probably like taking care of most of your clients. With home health in there, it enables you to take care of your clients longer. Because if they end up going to the hospital, are you taking care of them when they're in the hospital? Are you taking care of them when they go to rehab? Are you taking care of them when they have to go to an assisted living? So home health is actually beneficial for the individual and also beneficial for this business and each one of you if you enjoy taking care of people, which if you're here, the odds are that you do. <laughs> okay. Three ways to qualify for home health. Administration of medications. So this doesn't count for pills, things like that. This is anything injected is a qualifier for home health. So what's something that's injected? Insulin. Insulin. This is, I'm kind of getting off on the weeds a little bit here. Yes, it's a qualifier. Home health can do insulin injections, but it's tricky because Medicare only allows 10% of all our clients or patients to be what's called an outlier, someone that needs to be seen more than three times a week. Insulin, how often do you do that? Every day. Every day. Most, at least once, sometimes twice, there's sometimes three. If they go to a facility, sometimes they come out four times a day. It's, it's crazy. So we can't do everybody that needs insulin because Medicare doesn't allow it. So it limits our ability to take care of quite a few people. But what else, what else is injected? Hormones. Hormones? Yeah. Hormone injections. Sometimes they need a hormone injection once a month. B12 injections, testosterone is one of those hormones that needs to be injected. Um, IV or injectable antibiotics or IV antibiotics. Anything that a nurse needs to do is a qualifier for home health. Okay, that's that's under administration of medications. Or health feels like catheter, but that's not injected. <laughs> oh, but, but if you have a catheter, you do qualify for home health. Catheter care is a qualifier for home health. <coughs> and guess what? We talked about teaching and training. Someone gets a new catheter, and sometimes they do self-catheterization, something that I would never want to do or want to train. But te under teaching and training, that is a qualifier for home health. What else happens under teaching and training, you think? We talked about insulin. A newly diagnosed diabetic probably freaks out. I'm diabetic. I'm going to die. And they have all this insulin. How, what percent of things do you think they remember in the clinic? <laughs> Even worse. I'm say nothing. I wouldn't. I didn't. Normal healthy people, there's only about, retain about six or less than 60 to 80 percent retain what the doctor said when they leave. Normal. No. You know, like. Not normal. I never remember what the doctor tells me. How much, when you're in the hospital and you discharge from there, what are you remembering? Maybe about 10%. Sometimes it's wrong. Well, yeah, because you're confused and scared and nervous in the hospital. So your, your brain's not thinking right and you're at a high stress moment and no, you're not going to remember. So under teaching and training, um, diabetic teaching, so when they're newly, newly diagnosed, the nurse comes in and teaches for two to three weeks, makes sure the caregivers, the family, and the individual knows how to, how to do an insulin injection when they're doing it right. A quick story, um, individual newly diagnosed diabetic goes into a clinic, learns, they show him how to do the injection. So they have an orange and they're injecting it, you know, okay, it inserts to this depth and here's the plunger and they teach him everything. And he comes in the clinic later and his numbers are all just completely wacko and, and they just, and so they, they clarify things, comes back again, numbers are completely off. 
apple. Show us how you're ejecting. So he grabs one of the oranges, ejects it, <laughs> peels the orange, and eats it. <laughs> so doesn't work that way. But that's some of the things that the confusion that can happen in the clinic. Okay. So. <laughs> so uh, bowel and bladder teaching. That's potty training. Uh, ostomy teaching. New ostomy, a colonostomy, or a urostomy. Um, uh, tube feeding. That's that's something that teaching and training to help you guys understand how you help your clients. That would qualify for home health. IVs. And here's where the the PT comes in. Gate and transfer teaching. Okay. And but we already talked about self catheterization. Also, new equipment, a new walker, or a wheelchair, different things. How do you use that Oxygen safely? Seat belt. That's coming up on the next one. Okay. Um, she, she, she's been around, she's grown a few things, I think. Okay. The last qualifying section is observation and assessment. So, what does that sound like to you? Watching. Watching. What are we watching for? Any change. Okay. How often do you guys notice something's not quite right with the clinic? Never sure. <laughs> often. <laughs> Depends on the day. <laughs> yeah. The, the, I'm sure you see things. because Your clients are getting services because they need help, and something's not quite right. But you, you get used to a baseline, and then, wait a minute, something's just changed. Okay, and I'm going to read this. This is straight from Medicare. So it could be a little, you know, like, oh, that's confusing, but I just want to point out the interesting section to it. Observation and assessment of a patient's condition by a nurse are reasonable and necessary skilled services when there is a potential for change in a patient's condition. That requires skilled nursing personnel to identify and evaluate the patient's need for possible modification. You hear those words? Potential and possible. That's what home health is for. If, say for example, okay, vital signs. What are some vital signs? I'm just thinking of four main ones that I'm going to help you. But I was just thinking of how am I going to remember the four main ones? Who knows what perturbed means? <laughs> I know what you're doing. What is perturbed? <laughs> if I'm perturbed, what, what happened to me? What's my. I'm annoyed. I'm, annoyed, I'm ticked off. <laughs> I'm anxious. I'm unsettled. <laughs> okay, perturbed. Pulse. Temperature. Respirations, blood pressure, perturbed. If my pulse, respirations, my blood pressure, my temperature are up, I'm perturbed. <laughs> right? So you can remember some key vital signs. Under observation and assessment, abnormal fluctuating vital signs qualify for home health. They have that. They can have observation and assessment for a nurse to come in and see them for two to three weeks. If things settle down and there's no additional problems, Medicare says, thank you very much for going in there and verifying that they're not getting worse or having a major situation. One hospital stay is 10 or 8 to 12 times more expensive than an entire CERT period of home health. If you prevent one hospital stay by having home health come in, Medicare is extremely happy and so are we because then our taxes are actually doing good instead of just being thrown away in a in healthcare costs that are outrageous. So um, abnormal fluctuating vital signs, weight changes, that's a qualifier. Edema. How many of your clients have edema? I mean if it's going you know crazy directions, yeah, that's a qualifier. 
abnormal fluctuating lab values. This is why they're going to the doctor and they're trying to get their, probably her INR or different thing. They're trying to, what is going on with her system? Uh, respiratory changes. How many times do you hear your patients? Patients, clients. Mm -hmm. um, clients are, develop a cough or, or they're breathing heavier. Qualified. Medication changes and effects. This is one of the main reasons why someone goes to a hospital. They go to the doctor, they get a medication change, they come back, either they didn't listen or they didn't understand and they're not taking their medication right or there's an adverse effect or something's going on, then they're at the hospital. So anytime a doctor prescribes a new medication or ingests, you want to, nurse should be verifying that it's working according to what the doctor wants it to happen. And if everything's good, the nurse is out in two to three weeks, and everything's fine. Uh, UTIs, suspected and con or confirmed. How many times do you notice a change in your client's behavior or confusion or weakness? How often is it a UTI? Nine out of 10. Nine, she says nine out of 10. Nursing and medical students over here, what do you think? In the uh, in the assisted livings, when the CNAs are there with their the people that are there needing help, as soon as they have a, a personality change or confusion or they start sleeping more or something's off, first thing they check is UTIs, and eighty percent of the time they are correct. UTIs in the elderly totally different than a normal person because they could have nausea, vomiting. Weakness, confusion, yeah. elevated heart rate, different things. Just but they get on it. If they get on it, personality change. Um, but they don't have urinary retention or, or they don't have pain when they're urinating. It's like, well, wait, that's a UTI. When, when not, but in the elderly, it can be different. Scary situation because a bad UTI can go lead to sepsis. If they get sepsis, they may only have hours. So that's why it's... I, say, I had a client that was in um, an assisted living where I was working, and she was pretty high functioning. She did her own care, and she died from a UTI. It, and I didn't... No one knew. She went to the bathroom by herself. She cleaned herself up. We didn't do anything for her. She got sick, and that was the end of it. Yeah. So I'm going to get a little bit personal here. Never had one before. I have no idea how I got a UTI. But it was right during the middle of COVID. And so everything was like virtual visits. You didn't want to go anywhere or whatever. I was doing a virtual face-to-face -face, you know, visit with my doctor. And he goes, okay, you got all the symptoms of COVID, but it's not COVID because this is a UTI. So I want you, I'm going to prescribe this antibiotic. Um, I don't want you taking this antibiotic tomorrow. I want you taking it tonight. I want you taking it within a half an hour. And if it gets really bad, you get to the ER because they're going to have to do the COVID protocol, so it's going to be annoying, but you get there. I had a temperature of 105.3, and I thought I was going to die. I was close to getting to the ER because I was going septic. It got into my blood. And it took me, this was a couple years ago, I consider myself healthy and not too old. But I felt that infection for a month. It traveled through my body, and I felt it one a couple days. I'd feel it in my intestines. A couple days, I'd feel it in my kidneys. I felt it in my lungs. I felt it travel to my heart. I felt it travel through my vital organs. And I, I thought, how? It, it took me a month to feel back to normal. And I'm thinking, how does an elderly person ever recover from sepsis or a bad UTI. And one of the statistics, 50% of the people that have sepsis, it, the ones that recover will pass away in the next year or won't get back to that baseline. So that's why UTIs suspected qualify for home health because you don't want them to get any worse or have a situation. 
behavioral management, newly ordered oxygen, we mentioned that, and our multiple complex comorbidities. Okay, that was a whole lot of talking. So, um, I don't know how long I'm supposed to go. Where was I supposed to go? Read it once. Read it once? Oh. I am not going to talk that long. But, but it's 12.35. Okay. Uh, any questions? There has to be at least a question. So it's always, it's always, basically it's better to over, um, like, report mm -hmm. than just... I know what you're saying, to be overly safe yes. than to wait and see. If you wait and see, where are they going? The hospital. And again, that's how we're doing it wrong. Where you mentioned it's preventative. And that's exactly what it is. The problem is you guys can't say, hey, we need home health, and then home health can go in. What needs to happen? A doctor has to write the order. But with your knowledge, I'm going to leave. Observation assessment, this form right here is an actual order form. One check in any of these yeses, and the doctor could say, okay, signs it, sends it in, that's an order. One check under administration of medications, that's an order. One check under teaching and training, that's an order. So I will leave one check in the yes box at the end. <laughs> And there's also little blanks down here for additional things that the doctor or you might know that may help. Oh, that sounded good. Is that your reaction? That was my reaction. <laughs> <laughs> I was so impressed. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. I haven't talked about hospice, but um, I'm going to talk a little bit about hospice. Uh, because I think home health, mo most people are more comfortable doing home health first to, to get that established mindset of, oh, okay, it's clear that we're doing, we've done everything we can and it doesn't appear that it, the things are improving. Or, and it's really hard for families. You probably noticed this. That word hospice can be very scary because hospice means what? Family member is dying. Who here in this room is not dying? <laughs> We're all dying. Who knows someone that can prevent death? Jesus Christ. <laughs> there you go. Very good. The only right answer. But that's that's only well, religiously speaking, that's only after you die. Right? <laughs> Well, except that. Uh, okay. All right. Hospice. Um, I was a hospice chaplain for two and a half years, and I learned a lot. Didn't know anything about hospice before I became a hospice chaplain. So it was like, oh, hurry up and learn. Yeah, and it was amazing. I could see myself going back and when I retired and be a hospice chaplain. It was, it was pretty great. Um, here's this paper I'll leave as well, a few of these. Eight signs that it may be time for hospice. Think of your clients and see if any of these things click in your mind. Frequent hospitalizations or trips to the ER. Frequent or reoccurring infections. Reduced desire to eat, leading to significant weight loss and changes in body composition. Rapid decline in health over the past six months even with aggressive medical treatments. Uncontrolled pain, shortness of breath, nausea or vomiting. Decreasing alertness, withdrawal, increased sleeping or mental confusion. Inability to perform tasks of daily living, such as eating, walking, using the bathroom, personal cleaning or getting dressed. Hello, personal care, you guys are <laughs> helping people in the past for sure. Decisions to focus or decision to focus on quality of life instead of aggressive treatment. So many times you say the word hospice to families and it's it's over here and you're not paying attention. If they have something in front of them that's that they can look at afterwards and read through, like, oh yeah. Oh, what is that? 
oh, yeah, I see that. Then they might go, well, do we need to ask some more questions or do we need to get more about this because these things are happening? The purposes of hospice, you mentioned um, comfort. Mm -hmm. That is one of the purposes. Three main purposes of hospice. Quality at the end of life. Control over end of life and comfort care at the end of life. Why why quality? What, what is hospice? What is how does hospice make it quality? They make the person comfortable. They help the family understand. Um, I mean, dying is not easy from mm -hmm. what I know. <laughs> not for most people. It, it's painful, and so there's medication they can take. Um, and the families, sometimes the families just are like, no, you're not giving my mother morphine. She'll get addicted to it. <laughs> your mother's passing away. <laughs> Don't think so. <laughs> okay. I, I honestly had a, a daughter tell me, you're not giving my, my mom morphine. Yeah. That's painful to hear. Yeah. <laughs> because from what I understand, I mean, your organs are shutting down, and that is very painful. Very, so very that's well happening. Painful. And if, you, and if you're shutting down and you, you can't breathe, you're in panic mode. Mm -hmm. And morphine actually reduces, and there's training on it a little bit, reduces air hunger. Mm -hmm. It relaxes the body so you can actually breathe more comfortably and you don't have that panic mode. Mm -hmm. I think I want morphine if I... Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like morphine, but I'll take it then. I understand family's perception. Like, no, we don't want to push that or you're going to... You're going to kill them by giving them so much morphine. Morphine's never given a whole lot at the very beginning. It's a minimal dose, and then it's increased depending on the effect of how the morphine affects the medication. So quality at the end of life. We all have, the, let's say we're all a battery. We only have so much juice, every single one of us. At the end of our lives, we've got this little bit of juice at the end. How do we want to use it? I choose not to go to rehab and exercise myself to death. I'm not going to rehab myself to death if I am terminally ill. I'm going to do those things that I want, and I'm going to be with family, and I'm going to have a quality of life. I didn't know all that before I became a hospice chaplain and then experienced being with hospice for 16, 17 years. There's there's no way, I mean, younger people have family, they're going to fight for their lives and things. Older, when you've lived a life, perhaps it's a different perspective. Everybody's individual, so that's where it's at. Control over the end of life, so instead of following the traditional course of end of life care, which involves seeking curative measures and frequent hospital stays and rehab stays, then you get to choose how you use your precious last moments, months. And hopefully you choose this a little sooner than right at the very end. What's the biggest complaint of hospice, of families? It's not really a complaint. We come in soon enough. We wish we would have done this sooner. That's the biggest concern or complaint that I've heard today. So when an individual qualifies, Again, a doctor has to write an order. We can't just say, hey, let's do hospice. Because you said when people want it? Yes, they do need to want it or recognize that they qualify and make the decision that that's what they want. But they do need to qualify. Okay. And then comfort at the end of life, we talked about that. Okay. When, going to go back to the questions, when do we do home health? When the doctor prescribes, okay, good. So there's an order. Before there becomes a problem. Before there becomes a problem. Okay. Good. And I'm, I'm, I'll ask other questions later because that'll be a wake up call. <laughs> when do we do hospice? End of life. End of life. Okay, I'm going to simplify it. Life limiting illness. With the normal progression of the disease, it would be a life expectancy of six months or less. That's a qualifier. 
Now, question. Um, I had somebody that I took care of that life expectancy was three months. And I took care of that person for eight years. Eight years. <laughs> well, how long of those years were they on hospice or were they on hospice? The whole time since they got out of the... Eight years? Yeah. Okay, that's a record. I, I was a hospice chaplain for someone that was just about four years. Um, and Medicare... Again, this wasn't in the U.S. It was back in my country, okay. but... <laughs> But okay, eight years. Yeah, <laughs> the lady that I that I had an opportunity to be their chaplain for, um, actually, I was a director. Anyway, um, she had heart failure. Her ejection fraction, medical school person assumed, was was ten to seventeen percent. In other words, her heart was functioning only at ten to seventeen percent efficiency. <laughs> she lived for four years. So, what was your situation? She had four cardiac affection, on one of them being the heart being on the opposite side, oh. overgrowth, arrhythmia. <laughs> she what? was diabetic. She had problems with her kidneys. Only one kidney was functioning, and she had three. <laughs> oh. <laughs> she was okay. born with three. <laughs> so. She had arthritis and strokes. So, you normal life expectancy if the yeah. disease takes its normal course six months or less obviously things don't always work out we don't know so if they qualify the benefits of hospice uh, that's another time because we're running out of time are really amazing and if they qualify they can stay on longer but hospice charts to the decline if they are getting a little bit worse or things have happened they still qualify if they stay the same for years, they have, they'll have come off hospice after six months or so. Or if they start to get better, Medicare won't allow them to stay on hospice because they don't qualify. Mm -hmm. She qualified for medical treatment in the hospice because she will have seizures at least three times a day. Oh. So. <laughs> How was her quality of life? Um, actually, she was very happy. It was my grandma, so... Okay, so her attitude, she was very happy, and she refused to let her sickness keep her down. Yeah, she just like, kept going. She, will, she will only say two words, and depending on her tone, we learn how to read it. Um, we knew what she wanted, so my dad will come in and, like, play music for her, and she will sing. So she was, she was happy and had a really good caregivers. <laughs> <laughs> so... Um, Okay. But. Well, we're going to move to the fun part here because I'm just going to, if, I, if you answer the question, you get to come up and play Clinko. If you drop, we'll show you how this works, say I put it here. If you get a, oh, if you get a 10, you're going to pick either a pen or, or a pad. If you get a 15, you get to go again because 15 falls right in the middle. <laughs> if you get a 20, you can pick anything you want. There's t-shirts, there's hats, dress balls. Oh wait, we'll say if you get a 10, if you get a 15 twice, or a 10, a 10 and a 15, you can pick a stress ball and a pad. I don't know, I don't know, you can pick any hand sanitizer. Okay, so. First question, uh, we'll see how many we can do in the short amount of time that we have. Okay, first question. Name one qualifier off this off these sheets that will qualify someone for home health. Injection. Yes. <laughs> Medically Shots. significant injection. Okay, come up and and have your turn. That's for her. That's for her? Yeah, the lady on the left. Okay. We're gonna speed. Another but name another qualifier for home health. Well fifteen go again. Okay, pen pad or a uh, stress ball? Or a ball? <laughs> okay, you can stay too. Since you had to go once. Alright, uh, that's the rule then. If you get, if you get to go twice, because you're 15. Okay, another qualifier for home health? Teaching and training. Teaching and training. Some, tell me something that needs to be taught. Um, okay. Alright. Two. 
two because you, you went twice. Okay, another qualifier. Can right. I go again? You, you can't go again. There's got to be somebody else. Okay. Did I not teach anything? Come on. Right? You're, you're making change, me a little nervous. Change of personality because maybe a UTI. A UTI. Good. UTI, that's UTI suspected or confirmed. Mm -hmm. Who wants to take her turn? She knew the answer. Oh. She's already gone once. Okay, we'll let you go again at the end. All right. That's fine. Okay, somebody else, you're running out of qualifiers if you don't go. Do I have a catheter? Yes, catheters. Uh, catheter training, teach me training under catheter, but catheter care is a qualifier for home birth. Okay, home birth, you'll do your turn. Name a qualifier. Hospital. Well, either, either one, home health or hospice. If you can name a qualifier for hospice, since I didn't go over them, <laughs> except one. Perturbs. What? Perturb. Perturb. Which means, what does it stand for? Uh, I'm not going to, but what we're talking about, vital signs. Yeah, yeah. Vital signs. Fluctuating vital signs. That is a qualifier for observation and assessment mm -hmm. under the home. of this. Um, I'd, like to get, I'd like to get rid of stuff here. CPAP, oxygen. What was that? CPAP, oxygen. If it's breathing. Yes, if it's yeah. newly ordered. Newly ordered because if they've been on it for a long time, but, okay. It's newly ordered. Yeah, newly ordered because they're teaching and training. It falls yes. under teaching and training. If they've had oxygen for a long time and they know everything, it doesn't qualify. But if it's newly ordered or something changes and they're not doing something right or a new equipment, then yes. Right. You have to help them, teach them how to use it correctly, and so that's a qualifier. Okay? You want to you go? <laughs> Changing medication. Oh, oh yeah, there, there's one. So, all right, you can come and get in line. All right, get it real good. Oh, that's a lot. Okay, two of, uh, two of the, either a ball, a pen, or a pad. All right, what was your answer again? Change of medication. Okay, just checking to see if you remember. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, that's that's so what? Right. Oh, that's so what? That's so what? A change in body weight. They lose a lot of weight. Weight changes. Yep. That's, that is correct. That is a question. 20, 20. Come on, open these. <laughs> 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 What is it? Uh, what are these? What are these? Yeah, one of one of one of them. A ball, a pen, and a pad. Oh, Thank you. Okay. <laughs> okay. Are we? Do people still have more answers? There are more answers. You can even come up with a good question to see if if you can't remember one of the qualifiers, just come up 
for the question to ask if they would qualify it for the circuit tax. I'll give you credit. Okay. I didn't know CPACs qualified. If it's newly ordered oxygen. So CPACs, you know, a change in equipment, we'd have to verify and get a doctor's order to say, hey, I want teaching and training on this because it may be a gray area. Yeah, I was going to say, I, I'm not ever. Ever. Yeah, it, I've had patients that needed that, but they also had other situations. So I don't know just that, but if it was newly yeah. ordered oxygen, it would. Okay. Good. Well, that was a good question, so. <laughs> Trying to, avoid. trying to avoid coming up and doing this? Yeah, well, yeah. Avoid winning a prize? I don't know. I, I swear I got like four 20s in a row last night when I was practicing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We're we, we've got, we've got uh, four more minutes. Anybody want to try to win? Besides you that wants to win them all? Sorry, I'm really competitive. Okay, I'm gonna make I'm gonna make it really easy. Someone that hasn't tried before, tell me. You don't need to tell. You can just give me their first name. Your favorite client and why. And why? Whose house did you just come from? How could I cheat? Just pick. Because you're <laughs> Tell me a story about it. I'll say John. We get to study the New Testament with John. <laughs> yeah. Good enough reason to play Kiko. <laughs> Have a favorite? Oh, come on! There's somebody. I only have one, Leslie. Yeah. There you go. Leslie, and yeah. oh, well, why does why do you like Leslie? What what? She's what's just you? sweet. She's always like wanting to know what's going on in the world today. She's homebound, so. Yeah. And you get to be the source of information. Yeah. So you feel valued. I do. You are important. Okay. <laughs> <You are. laughs> Two more minutes. So <laughs> who, who hasn't had an opportunity? Have you had an opportunity? I haven't. So, your favorite? Um, you know, I, I love helping Rochelle. Okay. Um, she's just the sweetest lady. She's. We always watch Jeopardy. The last question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. She always guesses, and sometimes she gets it right. <laughs> One of my favorite ladies when I was a chaplain was Pat. She was a staunch Irish Catholic. And I could not interrupt her Price is Right time. <laughs> I either had to sit down with her and enjoy it, oh or don't come. <laughs> so I understand. Yes. Well, uh, Question or anything? Allison, who's your favorite client? Was your favorite client? Well, I had two favorites. <laughs> Betsy and Mary. 
had a reason or something <laughs> or an experience or something? They were just amazing individuals. I always learned something, just a life lesson or a way to look at the world in a positive light. Totally get that. I had a, a patient in my chapel who was 102, oh. and he talked like Jimmy Stewart. Oh. <laughs> you know, his attitude was like that. All the time. It was just amazing. He would, he would be in his loop. In a room upstairs, and why is everything on me? I got the TV, my daughter here's the food. What more can I want? It's just amazing. Okay, let's see. We've got to get a 20. Yes, we have one. We've had one 20 person. Oh, what the heck? Turn the last person. I'm cheating for you. <laughs> It's rigged. <laughs> think about it. Okay, but I just wanted to say thank you for oh. coming oh, and she, giving us information. Oh, sorry, were you going to do wrap up? No, I'm going to wrap up. It is usually done. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were saying that. No, you finish and then I'll say thanks. This is just a little thank you for coming and. Are we gonna sh are we gonna share all that? That's for you. Thank you for coming. When you come <laughs> yeah. upstairs, though, there's lanyards on the. Stair, real, whatever um. thing. So if you have one of the newer badges, it fits that. So you can take one of those, and then there's rolls up there. So with homemade things from Jan. Yes, yeah. thanks to my mom, Listen. not me. The homemade rolls were from a friend. I am not. Okay, I'm so going. Finish up, and then we'll. Yeah, I will leave. I will leave a few of these papers. Value of hospice care and uh, eight signs of general decline. I'll leave a few of those just in case you've got somebody that you want us to talk to about. I'll also leave this Redefining Home Health. It talks about the observation, assessment, teaching, and training, administration of medications. Top five signs you would qualify for home health. We talked about most of these over here. You can kind of do a little interview of like, okay, this is going on. Also, leave copies of these so you can see what we talked about today, and this is a summary of those. Okay. Any final questions? Did you learn anything? Yes. yes. Was it helpful? Yes. yes. Okay. Good. Thanks, thanks for coming.